My name is Anthony Gray. I'm a member of the board, uh, the Passive House uh, Massachusetts Board, and excited to be here with you all on this uh, symposium day for us. As usual, we are, you know, in person. This time we're meeting virtually and we're trying uh, to the best of our ability to work out all the kinks um, and all the hiccups. But uh, we are session two, so hopefully we learn something from session one and we do a little bit better now. Um, but this session is uh, really, it, it's, it's very uh, tied to, you know, one of our stated um, focuses this year, you know, was uh, passive house and renewables being the path to net zero. And uh, our first presenter, his name is Michael Hendel, and he'll be on with us shortly. Um, but, but his company is called uh, Passive to Positive, and that's just like a perfect uh, way to think about things. And similar to how, you know, Passive House Mass has been focusing on Passive House plus renewables equaling net zero. And I'm sure Michael can talk more about the positive, um, but, you know, even going in the opposite direction, not being a consumer, but a producer, net positive building. Um, but let me go in and uh, share a little bit more about Michael's background. So he's, he's the founder and principal of Passive to Positive, as Jess mentioned. That's a building enclosure and energy efficiency consulting firm. Uh, they specialize in passive house, zero energy, low carbon and resilient design. He is also a co-founder and principal of Common Ecology, a regenerative and permaculture-based design company focused on regenerative community redevelopment projects. Michael became one of the nation's first certified passive house consultants in late 2009. He has consulted on passive house, zero energy, living building challenge projects that include single family, multifamily, residential, mixed use, and small commercial projects from Washington, DC, up to New Hampshire. He has experience in both new construction and retrofits and is committed, committed to low toxicity, low global warming potential and carbon sequestering building materials. Uh, you're making me work hard here. <laughs> but, but anyways, Michael's gonna uh, talk to us about a project that, that he is on where he's using a unique uh, and fresh approach to hot water systems and multifamily um, and a multifamily project. Um, so without further ado, I can pass it over to Michael and he can share about that with us today. Hey everybody, um, thank you for the introduction and thanks for the invitation. Of course, um, <clears throat> I come to this presentation in particular, but all of these presentations with our Passive House community with a, a good deal of humility because you can write a good introduction. It makes you sound good, but um, I've been on the learning curve steeply, on a steep learning curve with my claws in it for 10 years. And um, I know that there are many people on this call who could grapple with these same issues as well, if not better. So. Um, I'm, 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 I feel privileged to be working on these projects and privileged to be talking to you all. And I also am uh, eager to hear how maybe we could have done it better. Um, in any case, um, this is my little company and these are some of the projects we're working on, which is fun. Some of them are in Massachusetts. Um, and the, um, the first commercial project was actually in the lower right-hand corner is Adam Street offices of Auburndale Builders. Uh, it's a net positive energy retrofit uh, of, a, of a small garage into an office building. Um, in any case, I'll get right to it. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, I seem to be having trouble. Okay, um, so this is the project I'm, I'm talking about today. And of course, many of the remarkable things about it, I do not take credit for, but this um, it's really the team, Boston Real Estate Collaborative, uh, Monty French Design Studios, Hacon Construction, Nordic Structures, um, BLW engineers, uh, they, everyone has been um, 
uh, a phenomenal team, HO engineers for structural. I'm sorry, I don't have those names up here. In any case, uh, it's a seven story uh, mass timber, 37 apartments, it's all electric. Um, we're, we're, we're trying to push on every project, low carbon envelopes, <clears throat> every project I do. Basically, I'm fortunate um, because I just started out as a passive house consultant. That's what I get hired for. So I don't really have anything but passive house. Uh, we do have a PV array on it um, and some groundwater recharge. So there's a bunch of really wonderful features of this project. And I feel very fortunate to be on it. Um, I'm, I would like to think that this project can be part of our sort of community-wide push to carbon neutrality. Um, one very positive thing is that uh, it is a mass timber structure. And so we have sequestered um, 844 metric tons of carbon dioxide in the wood structure alone. Um, I, have not, um, I have not done a full life cycle analysis on the building, um, but that fact alone is, is hopefully pushing us in the right direction and away from concrete and steel. Um, just a, um, a housekeeping note here. Um, um, we are getting people in, into the waiting room and they're popping up on my screen. So I don't know if uh, Anthony or Aaron, if you're seeing them as well, but I'm happy to admit them. It's just. Yeah, um, yeah, we'll, we'll take care of that, Michael. I'm, okay. I'm monitoring that and I'm okay. trying to bring them in. <laughs> All right, great. I just didn't want to um, ignore them and, and, um, and leave them hanging out there. Okay, so in any case, yes, the, the goal uh, of, of, of everything we do is try to do you know, high efficiency passive house buildings, but do it in a, in, a, in a carbon sensitive way. And of course, this leads to the problem statement um, that a lot of us are pushing beneficial electrification. I'm 100% on board with that, but that also leads us to an awful lot of heat pumps which is great, except that refrigerants are a leading cause of climate, climate change. And I think you've all seen it before. So I put it tiny in the bottom left, but the chart of the uh, carbon emissions per capita that um, I got this chart, I think from, the, um, from architecture 2030, but it might've been a, another source. I can, um, I can pass that on if anyone needs it, but basically the United States is the very tall dark red line on the left. And then the poor world average is a, is a line running horizontally very near the bottom of the chart. And this is to say that, you know, uh, grinding, I once read in the Economist magazine, grinding poverty, it turns out is very sustainable, but it's also devastating to people who suffer it. So um, as we bring up, hopefully, the living conditions of the poor, poor, poor world, which is, I think, probably an unfortunate nomenclature, um, but the lower income world, uh, you know, billions of people <laughs> buying refrigerators and air conditioning systems for the first time. And it's hard to see unless we really tackle um, refrigerant uh, aggressively, it's hard to see how we solve our climate change problems just by beneficial electrification and reliance on more refrigerant. So um, if I'm naive about this and missing something, I'm happy to hear about it, but it's a concern I have. And I know a lot of other people probably on this call have. Um, so I've been looking for any way to use CO2 refrigerant systems. And we have it for hot water, the sand and sand code system. Um, and so I've been looking for any opportunity to pursue that. So um, as I mentioned before, there's a mass timber project which offers great benefits in terms of carbon and aesthetics and uh, all kinds of other things, but it does require a different kind of coordination uh, and it's not the common method of construction necessarily. So people aren't necessarily used to having to think about coordinating things that they used to just run through an open web truss. So, or a, if there's a shallow <clears throat> steel uh, deck, there's, uh, I'm sorry, steel and concrete deck, there's usually plenty of room for running mechanicals. Well, in this case, it's not, true necessarily. And with height restrictions, we had to focus on um, coordination of systems. So we had to understand how the beams and the columns being set up affected our uh, mechanical systems. Our solution, it felt pretty sensible to go with um, uh, decentralized systems as the path. 
And on most of our other multifamily projects, we're doing sort of shared or gang systems. But for uh, heating and cooling and ventilation, we are uh, to decentralized VRF system. I mean, a, a VRF system and a decentralized ventilation system. Um, so this is the floor plan. We have limited plenum space. And as you can see, we have a very small corridor and we have very small mechanical spaces. So we really don't have a lot of space to draw heat from for a conventional heat pump water heater. Um, so we ended up deciding to go with two uh, water heaters and to gang them, um, the northeast corner and the southwest corner, basically, um, two apart uh, three apartments each um, would be served by one sand and hot water heater. Uh, it, I'm told by those who are doing the BIM coordination, everything that this actually helps significantly with the vertical and horizontal coordination. Yes, we have to coordinate horizontal pipe runs, but we didn't have any vertical uh, pump lines to coordinate. And that helped a lot, not so much because the pipes themselves were huge and took up a lot of space, but because there were other things that you didn't have to work around. Um, or other ducts and such wouldn't have to work around them. So we're allowed um, small penetrations in this in the uh, blue lamb beams, but not large ones. So we were able to do um, this decentralized system. We gang three apartments on one tank. We have three short trunk lines, um, which are in these dark blue, dark red, and dark green. And then we have uh, to meet the passive house requirements of, of low um, spillage of under 0.6 gallons of uh, spillage of water before you get a 10 degree temperature rise, we needed to have short uh, runouts from the trunk line. And so this system, it's on occupancy sensors, but there's also a, a temperature sensor to prevent every time you walk into the bathroom, it triggering the recirc loop. So basically, it there's an occupancy sensor in the bathrooms, but then it checks to see if the temperature actually requires the research to operate. And so that's um, the system we came up with. So this just gives you a sense of now that we have our hot water tanks in on the interior corridor, we also have to plan for the circulation to and from the outdoor unit. Um, we Again, Hacon Construction has been an absolutely phenomenal partner, and they do a lot of the in-house work and coordinate very, very closely with the architects and the engineers. So they've done all this BIM clash detection. It's been really fun for me to watch. Um, this shows you where the tanks are, the, the uh, yellow circles up in the middle um, of the floor plan. That's where the tanks are for, for short distribution. And you can see how the outdoor units are hung on the side of the building. Um, the one on the right is, is sort of perpendicular to the face of the building, and that's the, the condition they ended up going with. Um, but I think uh, this is my next problem statement, that doing this, hanging these uh, heat pumps out here is very painful for architects. And uh, if we love our architects' friends, as, as I do, uh, we need to find a different solution. And so, um, you know, I feel like as a passive house consultant who's not an engineer, not an architect, but just someone who cares about the environment, um, my own level of exposure uh, to these different technologies increases and my own maybe advocacy for solutions improves over time. And so I wasn't necessarily aware at the time of ways in which we could provide uh, efficient recirculation loops. Um, and I'm still not sure I have the answers, but I think it's more possible now. So I think to save, um, um, the heartache of an architect putting uh, condenser units hanging from these balconies. Um, we do need uh, efficient circulation loops and we need to innovate how we make that circulation work only as much as needed to provide the hot water quickly and efficiently. Um, so that's, I think, just maybe another mountain to climb for me. Although I will say that we, um, we are, um, pursuing that on other projects, one with POA in Washington, DC, our mechanical, our plumbing engineer there did some very cool uh, calculations to determine if we just had an aquastat in the line, how often that pump would run if the pipes were well insulated. And it turns out it was relatively minimal. So I think on those projects, um, and I think I saw Julie Klump is on the, on the call. Um, <clears throat> it appears that we would have a relatively low runtime of the circulation loops to have a more centralized system. 
So um, we're going in that direction. I'm sure people on the call maybe know more about that. I'd love to hear about it. Um, so, but we have another problem statement here, which is this is still a VRF system and, and they're not low refrigerant. And so, I, as I said before, I do ask, how can we fight climate change with these kinds of systems um, until we get a refrigerant such as CO2 in the sand and heat pump, um, you know, that is not a global warming uh, threat. So the sand and heat pump water heater is a very small piece of this building in terms of refrigerant. So that's another uh, threshold that we'd like to cross. Um, and indeed, um, we have another project coming up in Boston. It's a 12 story mass timber structure hotel. And so in this case, we are indeed going with um, decentralized packaged heating and cooling systems, um, the newly available systems. I think I saw Tim McDonald in the call as well. They're the, these uh, HPAC systems, and um, I think it's called VHP or something um, from IFOCA. Uh, these, these systems seem to offer us, particularly in a hotel where they're doing you know, these kinds of units anyway, a really good option for a packaged low refrigerant uh, heating and cooling um, and ventilation. So we're doing that and we're also now exploring with our, um, our mechanical and plumbing engineer sub um, uh, consultants, the options of recirculation um, that will be efficient and effective. So let's see. Um, so basically uh, that's, that's all I've got, but um, I hope that this fits into our, our broader community mission to provide high levels of performance and comfort, but do so in a way that starts to reverse the, the trend and, and not only reduce uh, climate warming uh, emissions, but start to draw down and sequester those emissions. So uh, thank you for your attention. Um, and I think, I don't know, Anthony, you can speak to the group about whether we're taking questions now or later. Yeah, well. I think I think if it's, if uh, everyone can have a, uh... Some patients, we could we could uh, address the questions at the end. If you have any other questions, you could just pour them into the chat. We'll try to get to them in the order that they were received. Um, but you know, in the interest of time, I want to make sure that yeah. we get to our next presentation. Okay. Um, well, thank you, everyone. I appreciate it. All right. Thank you, Michael. That was great. That was great. Very interesting. Um, the, the sand and CO2 heat pump. And I know there are questions and we'll try to get to those in, in the chat later. But we want to move on to the next presentation that we have today, um, which is uh, you know the heating and cooling portion of our electrification discussion. And um, that, that's the retrofit of a existing building um, you know, to, to to a new system that, that Wesley Stanhope is gonna talk about and I can just introduce him really fast. Um, so he has over 15 years of leadership experience in the built environment on both sides of the Atlantic, working in the USA, Ireland, and UK with construction facility conditions, assessments, energy management and commissioning projects. Wes is responsible for developing and implementing building evolutions, vision, mission, and philosophy. Wes is both active in the long-term planning and operations of the company, as well as the day-to-day -day operations. As principal of Stanhope Developments, he brought over 370 commercial and residential construction projects from proposal through to design and completion in Ireland and UK. After returning to the US, Wes managed the energy auditing and retro commissioning of over 23 million square feet of US federal facilities. Wes also has extensive experience managing and implementing assessments and commissioning of large scale private universities, commercial properties, state facilities, nonprofits, and large multifamily developments. Additionally, Wes is also a uh, adjunct faculty member at Mount Wachusett Community College and the Boston Architectural College. So with no further ado, we'll turn it over to Wes this morning 
and he will give us a presentation on um, this hex system for this building that he's working on. Take it away, Wes. Okay, good. All right, so Anthony, we only have about three hours, you said, to get through this presentation, right? So I'll try to keep it short. Just about. All right, so I see a few giggles, so people are awake. That's good. So what we're going to do today is following off from Michael talking about you know the need to reduce the amount of refrigerant in buildings. We're going to go through a project that we're working on right now with POA, and it is the uh, HEX system that we're using with Mr. Dishi. So I'm going to give you a little bit of our project background and what is business as usual if we were to um, replace systems in a building. And our go-to would be the VRF if we were doing an upgrade for performance here. And what is the HEX? And then the showdown between the systems. So the project background for this particular project, why are we making changes? Well, what we have here are two complexes in Attleboro. We have GT1, which is you know a large uh, three-story building with 92 units. You can see there uh, Ken Newhauser in the picture. He's having the contractors rip the windows out and do window mock-ups before they rip their hair out working on the actual project. Um, so we're working on the building performance of the project, but how do we get over some of the issues that this building has? It has heating, central heating, natural gas boilers coming towards the end of their life. The distribution itself is um, getting towards the end of this life as well. As through wall and through window AC, we see that a lot. But in the case of this building, where it has a through wall or through window AC in some locations, it goes into an enclosed lobby or a balcony area. So it's not really taking its uh, cooling from the outside. It's just passing it from one part of the building to another. And typical old style of ventilation, it's exhaust only if the exhaust fans work. The other building is uh, called GT2. It's slightly bigger a little bit more complex in geometry, but it has similar issues. It has a central gas um, heating plant. Some of the building has cooling, some does not. But when the previous owners retrofitted cooling to the building, they just passed that chilled water through fan coil units that weren't set up for chilled water. Where does the condensate go? Well, it just leaks into the building. That's no problem, right, Anthony? So the other parts of it is just through wall, uh, through window AC for cooling. And again, it's exhaust only ventilation if it works. One other issue with this building was it's a mill, like we have a lot in New England. When you have a mill, you think of water. Now well, there's water here. And on the high side of the building, the building is actually below water level. Where's that boiler plant? They don't put it in the penthouse suite. It's in the lowest point of the building where there's very little windows to look out at, which is below the water level. How much? Well, it's about four feet below water level. So if there's a flood, you got to send your maintenance team in there with their scuba gear on to maintain those boilers or do any work on them afterwards. So there's other issues here that they need to tackle to replace the systems. The newer lock and var you see there for the domestic hot water and the heating, that's just temporary to get it through the construction phase of this project because it had some issues and failures. So they're going to be pulled out and repurposed maybe after this project. On these buildings, we were amazed going through what the maintenance team were doing. I mean, if you look at the picture on the left, they were probably the most organized maintenance team I've seen on buildings. A place for everything. Everything is placed. Color-coded on the floors on how to walk around the boiler, uh, boilers and domestic hot water inside the mechanical room, stuff like that. The thing is, is that when it was renovated maybe in the 80s, they didn't necessarily renovate it to be a maintainable building. If you look at the fan coil unit on the right, that fan coil unit is encapsulated in the gypsum and to such an extent that you can't get a coil out. You could barely get a fan motor out. You can't really change filters. So even with the best maintenance team down there, they're snookered when it comes to trying to maintain parts of this building. And again, to mention, for our GT2, where they had put the chilled water into some of those fan coil units, they were you know, corroding out from all the condensation occurring and then dripping behind into the actual um, building enclosure. So what do we do? Well, I'll, one option for some building owners is you know, business as usual. But 
we don't necessarily want to do that. But what would that be? Well, we replace boilers and we put in newer, shinier boilers. They're not going to look like that in 20 years, but when they put in, they're looking really nice. Same thing for cooling. We could put in some chillers, whether it's air-cooled chillers or cooling tower, like you see in the top right, so that we could cool the chilled water going you know, through the building and provide it with some cooling. We could connect that to the building. So we have the boilers and the chillers for the primary loops providing the heating and cooling to that secondary, the building loop. And then that is going to provide to the vertical stacks for the fan coil units so they can have heating and cooling. The issue with this is that you're locking the building into being a, you know, a lower efficiency, you know, maybe um, cooling system, but you're also locking into being a natural gas burning heating system. And it's also a switchover. It's either going to be in heating mode or it's going to be in cooling mode. So get ready for our occupant um, complaints coming up through the management team. But not necessarily part of the scope. You know, replacing all that secondary loop, it leaks. But let's just keep on patching it and replacing it because it's hard to get to. And if, it's not, if it doesn't have cooling today, it might, it's not going to have cooling tomorrow. It's only part of the building that has cooling now will get replaced. So we're not really even comparing apples to apples when we're looking at a business as usual versus a VRF or a HEX system to begin with. So the typical that we'd start to look at is, well, put in a VRF system, you know, have a refrigerant across the building. It's the go-to option. And we would always go, hopefully go with the one with a branch controller or a branch selector box, depending on the manufacturer. So you have heat recovery, not necessarily for energy efficiency, but so you don't have the occupant complaints. So somebody could be in heating, somebody could be in cooling, and everybody's comfortable. But the problem with that is, like you see the red bar at the top, from start to finish, it's all refrigerants. Typical diagram from this case here, it's Mr. Bishi showing the actual refrigerant lines from the outdoor units through the branch controller to all the fan cool units in every apartment. And going back to that building diagram again, you no longer have that secondary loop or the primary loops of the boiler and chiller. You now have that, that VRF system, but the whole building has the refrigerant lines running through it. So could be through the corridors, but it's going to every occupied space, you know, every occupied apartment unit in that building through the community rooms, such, such as that. Refrigerant is um, everywhere people are. So what was the alternative that we tried to look at? So we looked at the hex and what the hex is. It? It's a different type of system, but it's trying to get the building off of the actual fossil fuels and cooling towers. Oh, you have all the chemical treatment that has to go along with that. The water evaporates. We have to keep on making up water to the system. Are they drained down in the winter time so they don't crack? There's so many issues. So what if we put in one central plant? What if we had one system that ran off of a, a refrigerant-based system but converted that heat, heating and cooling to water, to the hydronic system? So this is a cut-through image of a hex box that uh, from Mitsubishi. This is an image I took on Monday from Southboro, their training center, where basically it's a heat exchanger that takes the refrigerant coming from the outdoor unit and produces the hot and cold water for the building. So anything to the left where you see the refrigerant to the outside, that might be your, your condensing unit outside in refrigerant. Anything downstream is more typical. It's just water flowing through your building. So looking at what we originally started to go through in this building was, well, how do we get a, the most amount of control, but keeping it simple? We had branch controllers. So we used our two Mitsubishi outdoor units, the branch con uh, controllers, and then every hex box was connected as a zone. So you had heat recovery happening at the branch controllers, just like you'd have with a VRF except for each hex would do a stack of three stories of apartments. The issue with that is that those three apartments would have to be in heating together. So hopefully they all get along in the same type of climate. Here's a here's an image of um, some installed hex units in Lexington, 
just give you an idea of what a what a central plant would look like indoors with the hex units. And here is how it would be connected. The refrigerant just goes from the condensing unit to the hex box. Everything downstream and using typical, what all the contractors are already used to, is just a two pipe or whatever you want to design to hydronic system. It could be fan coil units. It doesn't necessarily scare the contractors. It's easy to install, but it's all water. The original mechanical plant that we looked at was having multiple hex boxes in the uh, mechanical room, each one going to a riser like you see in the left of the screen. And that riser of three apartments are all connected, three or four apartments, they're all connected for their temperature. So it was a, it was, we were trying to come up with a control system with Mitsubishi where it'd be a voting. So that if two were in heating, one was off and a third was in cooling, it would go to heating mode. And it would go switch back and forth depending on what this riser wanted. It ended up being a little bit difficult to try to work out the controls and it was going to be costly on the control side. So we, uh, sorry, just here would be the building loop. If we were looking at it this way, the actual uh, condensing unit for edge controller, each hex goes to a vertical riser and all the controls would have to go from Mitsubishi Diamond control package from the condensing unit to each uh, fan coil unit through the building to get that control to actually work for that voting. And the bottom hex might be in heating, the top hex might be in cooling, and each riser, it could be, have its own independent control. After looking at this for a while, we decided, well, we're looking at the team with Peterson and TAT and POA, that it was actually less costly to pull electricity to each unit and put in a water source heat pump and make this a condenser loop. In this case, we get rid of the branch controller. It's just a, a Y-series outdoor unit, which is less costly, that provides the heating and cooling to the hex boxes, but they're all connected together, like, like you'd have modular boiler plants, two, three, four, five of them together connected as one plant. They would provide heating to a two-pipe hydronic loop to the building. And then each apartment could have its own heating or cooling independent of each other um, with the water source heat pumps in the units. Now this provided the, you know, overcame the issue of what if somebody wanted heating on a riser and somebody wanted cooling? Well, now they could. And it has heat recovery throughout the entire building that's connected by the two pipe condensing unit. Uh, so it has a better heat recovery through the actual system. The boiler plant becomes a whole lot simpler. Looks a little bit more traditional where you have I picture those hex boxes similar to being like a like a like boilers inside of a room going to your pumps and then out to the actual two pipe distribution. It's a simpler installation is what they found through the actual design on the system. And then as it progressed, as you can see here, we have the outdoor wide series unit on the VRS and multiple hex units are providing such like modular system modular boiler system providing the heating and cooling to the building loop and then multiple risers are pulling off that building loop to get their heating or cooling independent heating and cooling simul you know uh, and heat recovery through that building loop so turning that hydronic system back to more traditional condenser loop with heat recovery but getting rid of the outdoor it's outdoor co uh, cooling tower by any need of a chiller or boiler. Now, looking at all that, it must cost a lot to actually do a system. It does, but how much does it cost compared to business as usual or the VRF or stuff like that? Well, we priced the business as usual on this project. I didn't, the contractor did, South Coast Construction in this case, and priced the actual two different hex systems. The business as usual for GT1 was going to be $2 million. But that assumed that the building loop that was leaking was going to remain. And that didn't add cooling to the building. That was fan coil unit replacement and changing out the boiler plants and pumps and anything associated with that. 
when we looked at going with the hex with the fan coil units, that's where you, each riser was lumped together. So you have independent control over risers, but all the apartments on each riser is connected together uh, for control. It was $4.7 million. But now you have heating and cooling, but just limited control based on a riser. When it went to hex with water source heat pumps, so now every apartment has its own individual control like you would with a VRF with heat recovery, um, it went to 3.3, nearly $3.4 million. So it went down substantially from the hex with fan cool unit. But that business as usual, that's not fixing the heartache of a leaky distribution system. And that's not given in the cooling and dehumidification that's needed in the apartments. So it's not really comparing apples to apples. It's like a, a rotten orange to an apple here because that's not going to fix the problems of the building. And that's the showdown between the actual hex and the VRF on the system. Well, it's like golf, unless you play like me. Less is more. Of course, I play value golf. I try to get as much hits as I can in a round. Uh, you need a calculator for that. Well, a typical VRF system, you're going to have the outdoor units to a branch controller and then refrigerant going through each one of the apartments or common areas, community spaces. So the refrigerant is distributed throughout the entire building. Well, if we're trying to reduce refrigerant in uh, spaces for either cases of refrigerant leaks where people are occupied or trying to reduce refrigerant altogether, make it easier for phase out and change over to a different type of refrigerant or limited to where the work needs to happen. How does that compare to a hex system? Well, we have refrigerant from the outdoor units. This is the mechanical room on the other side of the wall. That's it. Everything else is hydronic. And that, and there's no occupied spaces that has refrigerant in it inside the buildings. And overall, this is about a 20% reduction in refrigerant. Another little comparison on it is how does the HEX system actually work compared to a traditional, well, traditional VRF system? The HEX system could give you about 115 degree water temperature in heating mode and about a 45 degree water temperature in cooling mode. So for a condenser loop with water source heat pumps, it's in the sweet spot, it would make sense. It could also work for a fan coil unit, especially on a new construction, but this is an old mill building. So the water source heat pumps um, would be needed for the heat loss. There is also a hex booster, which could only work in heating mode and bring it up to 160 degree water. One other thing kind of touching on to what Michael was talking about was what's next, and he already started with that, but if the basis of design for this project was now, because we started this a year, little over a year ago, what would we have added? I took these photographs yesterday. This is the QAHV system. This is the domestic hot water um, CO2 you know, system that Mitsubishi has uh, come out, something like this would for this large scale renovation project would probably be added to the project. So any, anything like this now going forward, we'd probably be investigating this type of uh, domestic hot water system. Whereas for that scale, it was tough to try to um, figure out a solution for it. Okay, I try to get through that in time. I think I nearly did. Excellent. Excellent. Thanks, Wes. Uh, you spared us a few hours, so we appreciate that. Thank you. <laughs> oh, when um, I turn off the video. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, so now I think there's a uh, plenty of time uh, for some questions in the chat, and we're going to reverse and go back to uh, Michael's presentation on the Sanco um, for Eleven East Linux. And let's see what the first question is. So one of the first question is, um, how does the carbon sequestration of mass timber construction compare to sequestering of traditional wood frame stick built or wood panelized construction? Michael, can you speak to that? I can try. I'm going to be honest with you. Like, um, you know, this, I don't know, 
discipline of carbon calculation, I think is still pretty, um, it's still pretty new in a sense that the data sets are, are incomplete and vary greatly in terms of both their quality and what they offer. Um, and so I'm not gonna be able to give you an absolute answer, but I can give you an intuitive answer. And honestly, I remember going to a Nessie conference a number of years ago now, and I was presenting alongside um, Jacob Rakusen, and um, we both we got a question like this from the audience. And we both kind of looked at each other and said, "You know, intu intuition can be a pretty good guide. Um, it doesn't, you know, if you're forced into a tough spot or you're trying to find marginal savings, um, yeah, you can do a full study. But intuition can also be a pretty good guide." All right, so to answer that question though, mass timber, you know, it said uh, in the carbon analysis we got from the manufacturer. So, you know, from you may take this with a grain of salt, but if we sequester 877 tons of carbon dioxide, um, that's great. And it also said that, you know, the, the North American forest will grow that much carbon in like three minutes. And so that's also great. Um, but I think generally we all want to take the approach as we do in Passive House and various other enterprises that less is more. And so, you know, if you couldn't build this building, uh, a seven story apartment tower, uh, I don't think just straight stick built, you'd need some other structural system um, and structural engineers in the room can correct me, but that's my understanding. And so for this kind of project, this is vastly, vastly superior to concrete and steel. Now, the other question is, is it sustainably harvested lumber? And in this case, yes. Um, and so that, you know, if it's not sustainably harvested lumber, it could really not be that much better than concrete and steel. So it could be, I mean, theoretically, you could get a very low uh, carbon footprint um, concrete, relatively speaking, you know, there are means of reducing the carbon the carbon equivalent of the concrete um, and maybe do worse with non-sustainably harvested timber. But this is sustainably harvested, so it is going to be much better. Okay, now how does it compare to stick frame building if you are on a four or five story building? Um, I don't know the answer because I haven't done the studies. I assume this would sequester a, a lot more just um, because of the uh, density of the material. Uh, however, if we all suddenly started building every building we could with mass timber, would there be any forest left? So, I mean, again, the intuition sort of does require that you ask yourself the question of like, maybe we need to use, and this, is, this goes to this kind of concept of appropriate technology, use it where it's most appropriate. I wouldn't just start using it everywhere. Um, that's my intuition. I am, we're actually gonna be speaking about carbon again for, um, for a, uh, a talk on November 3rd uh, that Aaron has, uh, and Hank have asked us to do. So we're gonna present some of our initial findings on a couple of retrofit projects. Um, uh, so maybe I can try to sneak in a slide on this question for that presentation on November 3rd. Yeah, if you wanna, uh, uh, when is that, Michael? Cause you said November 3rd, that's today. Uh, I, th I think I saw it. Was it the 18th, maybe? Oh, I'm sorry, the 18th. Yes, yes today <laughs> is November 3rd. <laughs> yeah, we're already yeah. here. <laughs> it, yeah, um, I better get ready. No, it's um, it's on the 18th. I'm sorry, and um, it appears that it's at noon, so maybe it's a lunchtime thing. That's that's what I have on my calendar. But um, yeah, so on the 18th, we're going to just talk about a couple of projects, a couple of retrofit projects, a couple of comparisons of wall types, um, going with uh, foam versus no foam. Uh, and and um, we're sneaking in a little bit about wood versus concrete in there too. So I, I'm happy to try to answer that question better for the next presentation. That's fantastic. We'll definitely try to look into that during that next presentation. One thing that um, Mark put in the chat as a follow-up, he said, I feel the term sequestration versus the term storage should be looked at carefully with yeah. wood a better understanding of how forests store carbon, including below ground, needs a lot more study. So, absolutely. Just, uh, and I, I um, maybe I could I could apologize. Like I, I do know that a number of people are using the word storing. Um, and if if 
you know, you are to reuse this wood after the fact, you're holding it longer and longer. So the storage lasts longer and longer. Um, the, the, the key thing right now is that um, pulling the carbon down now in even more rapid growth cycle crops for carbon storage has a greater impact. Um, these trees are, you know, the last 50 years worth of carbon, right? That's been pulled out of the atmosphere. Like, so we need to not only use this material, uh, but we need to use other rapid growth cycle materials to pull down more carbon faster and store it. And then that end of life cycle phase is where you get to decide whether you've just stored it for a few years or stored it for 200 years or, you know, 100 years. So we've got to pay attention to that as well. Um, so Mark, thanks for the the, the good question. Great, great. Um, one of the other questions here in the chat, um, Lance, how far are we from having the waste cooling from these heat pumps be recovered during warm weather? Wes, maybe you can take that because he kind of clarified something at the end. So let's just see on the sand, on the sand and uh, Mark asked, is, is there any need to address uh, freeze protection on the sand and outdoor units and the piping? Um, Michael, I don't think that the tanks are outside. It's just the condensing se condenser section, right? Yeah, there were, were, I mean, there, there's a, with the package, basically you can buy freeze protection valves, you can, you know, the insulation and the, um, uh, and the heat trace. Um, so that's what we're doing on this project and I can, pop an image of that into the chat or something. Yeah, that'd be great. Okay. So moving on to, there was a question about, okay, yeah. So the, the condenser loop in the domestic hot water, Wes, I know you mentioned that new uh, system from Mitsubishi that's coming out. Is that something that integrates with like the the VRF or? It's its own outdoor unit, CO2. Okay. It produces hot water. Um, we're going back in the 16th to the training center to actually play with the system a bit more. But uh, it's produced, I think, like 160 degree output of hot water out of it. And it doesn't integrate with the actual VRF, but you could, like say, a typical VRF or a, a hex system, it's its own system you could have something like preheat the water or have it integrate with the tanks that are indoors um, the hex itself could be used to preheat the domestic hot water if you wanted that off the loop we did look into that for this project but it was to have a hex unit work off the building loop to produce domestic hot water like say we're in the cooling season and we're trying to reject that heat it wasn't necessarily feasible when we're looking at that time to integrate that into the actual system, but it is something that could be done on a project. Like even at the training center they had there, they it's not in that photograph I showed, but they have two hex boxes attached to that QAHV, but it was more for testing. They were sending hot water, like 160 degree water out of the QAHV and then chilling it with the hex box and sending it back to the QAHV just to test capacities. But you could use them together so one preheats the other or preheats another type of domestic hot water system. So it's getting there. We need to get more of these installed to be able to play with them more. Got it, got it. All right, questions keep pouring in. Let's see what's next. Uh, let's go, okay. So regarding the COP on the VRF versus the HEX, plus the water source heat pumps. Was that something that you guys looked at or considered, Wes, or maybe you can just touch on that a little bit? No, we didn't necessarily get down into the rabbit hole of looking at the C a COP of the overall system too much. Um, we did, the main concern was trying to reduce the amount of refrigerant within the actual building, not bring refrigerant to occupied spaces. How to do that with simultaneous heating, cooling control and um, how to simplify the system. And having a VRF system to the outside that has a high efficiency for replacing the central plant that's traditional, 
and how can we get this into a larger buildings that they like I know Julie put in the comments here these are historical buildings well where do you put these outdoor condensing units are critical you can't VRF traditionally only like takes certain pieces of pie or slices of bread to that loaf it can only take in 20 ton seg segments or 32 ton segments of the building what do you do when you run out of space you, you have a, uh, refrigerant lines lengths that you have to stay within with this, it gets away from that type of a restriction. So if you have a really tall building, a 20-story building, you could actually go from top floor to bottom floor with a condenser loop and have it run by a hex system in a central location um, because it doesn't have that restriction on it. So it's getting over all these other hurdles and reducing the refrigerant was the main priority, but it's something that could be looked into. I see. Okay, thank you, Wes. Let's see what's up, what else is there? Questioning, we talked about that. Uh, just a follow up on the sand and uh, heat trace on the potable water loop sent to the sand and outdoor unit. I saw you put something in the chat, Michael. Um, um, so, yeah, I just put in the, uh, on the accessories page is the, is the, is the freeze protection there's a sort of scroll halfway down, there's a freeze protection stuff that is sort of uh, proprietary that comes with the unit or you can buy with the unit. Um, right, right, right. Okay. Uh, there are other questions that I don't, you know, honestly, I'm not <laughs> the mechanical or plumbing engineer on this. And um, I, as the past post consultant have been deferring to uh, sure. the Sandin um, support and the, uh, and the, MEP on this, so I'm not sure I'm going to have the answers to the technical, uh, the, te the the more technical questions. Although I am very curious, as are you, so um, I can try to take a crack at them. Uh, I don't know what the issue is with the potable water loop. Um, yeah, yeah, that that was kind of like tying into the uh, cooling uh, system to kind of recover some quote unquote waste cooling. Um, but I think, you know, Wes uh, chimed in on that and mentioned that that is, is something that can be done, but it wasn't looked at on, um, on his project. And it doesn't sound like it was something that was looked at on, on 11 East Linux, the project that you're working on, uh, which is fine. So what else is in here? So okay, even so though it's the BC QIHV, it's going to have heat trace on it. So even the large scale commercial one will have heat trace on those pipes to get it into the building. So that's not unique with one system. You don't want that water to freeze. Right, right. Okay, um, so let's see what else here. And I don't know the answer to the question about whether the projections of how often the heat trace runs is built into the COP or not. Uh, that's a great question, and I'm gonna I'm gonna look back on my end and see if I can figure something else out about that. I suspect it would be such a project specific and region specific thing that it's not. Um, so we, you know, we may have to ask um, our mechanical engineer or maybe us try to do a, a, a back of the envelope calculation of how often that's likely to happen under what conditions. Um, I don't know the answer offhand. Here, Mark's putting in some good questions. So thank you, Mark, for that. <laughs> it's keeping things, keeping things running, making us scratch our heads a bit. But this looks interesting. So the sand in issue is that potable water goes to the outdoor unit so that piping is vulnerable to freezing. There are protections built into the sand in, but old people <laughs> remember the protections built into potable water and solar hot water systems and how those occasionally failed and the systems froze. For example, what happens in an extended power failure? That, that's, that's, a good. <laughs> well, that's something to think about um, on, on this. And, you know, maybe that's a discussion, you know, cause I'm actually looking at Sandin on, on a project myself. And perhaps that's a discussion with the manufacturer to see if there's any, um, any other methods that they have for, you know, cold climates like ours um, to protect against the, these freezing scenarios. Well, it also adds to the, the resiliency question, which is a big part of what I think both of these presentations also 
play into is, you know, if you have, uh, you know, in our, our POA projects in DC, we're doing, um, you know, Julie got a grant to do some resiliency studies, backup battery storage studies. And um, so the idea of putting certain items on a critical load resiliency list that get wired to a backup panel that can self power and have the backup battery storage size to that critical load, that would be a great solution potentially um, from a non-engineering <laughs> perspective, uh, from an intuitive perspective, you know, that sounds like a great solution. Uh, so you don't have that problem if you do have an extended power outage. Um, but I also think um, that, you know, if these things are running, making, making hot water at negative 25 degrees and they're running through the system, uh, they probably are protecting themselves from freezing for the most part, right? But it would be, um, and I don't know if they have, uh, I, I wanna ask the, um, the engineer also, uh, or stand in support if they have a sort of a, a defrost mode that sort of circulates water just to, de to defrost the, uh, just to keep the system warm. I don't know the answer to that either. That's good. So that's, thank, thank, thanks everybody. We're all, you know, as Michael mentioned, we're all learning and, you know, discussions like this help us to, you know, put forth better designs and better systems. So thank you everyone for the questions. Um, we're pretty much at our time. So I think we're going to close this down here, but thanks, special thanks to our presenters, Michael and Wes, you guys did a great job. Very interesting projects, very interesting solutions to, you know, the issue of electrification. Um, so thank you guys for that. Yeah, it was good fun. Thank you. We got two and a half hours left to talk though, right? <laughs> Yeah, answer all these questions. Get out your manuals. <laughs> <laughs> Take care all right, everyone. Thank you all for attending and being a part of this.